that is a, a fantastic service yeah because dd is a good um <laughs> mirror for people and it's a great primary host for people who have more adult subjects or you know different kind of things that aren't mm -hmm. accepted so much everywhere else you know different drawing styles even that's not and, so accepted. Uh, like a lot of them are very unique in some way or form and they are really not you know web material and yeah. tapas material hello and welcome to the quack cast this is the drunk duck quack cast we're up to quack cast number 470 and for this quack cast we're going to be talking about the things that inspired us to create or not really that it's um it's the things that created a reaction in us and that made us start creating because it, it inspired a reaction from us we last week we were chatted about cartoons that made us the cartoons that date us and the, these were the things that were really striking to us at certain points in our lives and this evolved into the idea of just anything that like uh, inspired us to create or, or elicited a reaction from us that uh, you know went on to inspire us further so but before we get into that I'll have to mention the featured comic quite a guck did the featured comic this week and she's going to tell us about Chinese Diary. So, Kwai, tell us about Chinese Diary. Hello, this is Kwai Dagakse, and the feature I've selected for this week is Chinese Diary. When a male student from the West embarks on a journey to southern China with the hope to be in closer proximity to the girl he longs to be with, he brings along a diary and records his daily adventures. This comic is based on a real Chinese diary that actually existed, and the stories from looking for housing to picking up new Chinese vocabulary words really did happen. The art is drawn on monochromatic yellow background in black and white ink. Finally, get permission to read through someone else's thoughts in a foreign land and read Chinese Diary. And that was our featured comic, Chinese Diary. Thank you very much for that, Kwai de Kukse. Okay, the featured music for this week. Gamalus has given us another theme to Sex Protectoress. <laughs> and that wasn't because he liked it so much. It was the opposite. Or not, not, not the opposite in that he didn't like the comic. It's that he did not like this version of the music that he did. He really didn't like it. And I said, like, ah, uh, come on, please let me listen to it. I want to hear, like, the original version before you came up with this other version. And so he relented and he sent it to me and I really liked it. I said, wow, I, I really love this. You know, why didn't you use it? Let's have this as another theme. And he said, yeah, okay. If you want to, if you want to do that, sure. So, yeah, this was Gumwalsh's original theme for Sex Protectress before he created the one that you listened to last week. So in this one, it's industrial synth metal. It's fast, burning, heavy, urgent, dark, black, acid, electronic, buzzing. This one seeps up from deep underground pipes, a viscous, tarry substance flaming up as soon as it touches the open air, superheating and then evaporating. So take it away, Gumwalls, with Sex Protectoress. <laughs> And that was Sex Protectress. Thank you very much for that, Gunwallers. Second version, Sex Protectress 2. By the comic is by B Mason33, and it's rated A, so not for underage eyes. This is a very adult piece of work. But very good. I like it. I would feature it if I could. 
Okay, so the topic of today's Quackcast, it is things that gave us a reaction. Creative products, media that called forth a reaction from our creative souls. Or just inspired us in some way. It's just something that spoke to us. It was evocative, I think. That's a good description. So... All right, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, we we sort of had a bit of a chat about this in our Patreon video. We very much appreciate all our patrons, and they um, keep the the site running because advertising really doesn't do it anymore. And yeah, we really appreciate our patrons. So we had a bit of a chat about this. Uh, for me, um, a lot of things inspired me. A lot of things like uh, that gave me a um, you know reaction. Um, but like, let's see, like Robotech, not Robotech. Yeah, yeah, Robotech was because it's got these uh like airplanes that transform and stuff like that, and I was really loving drawing these mechanical things. Um, Thundercats, the way the um, the way the mecha, the way the vehicles were created in that cartoon, that inspired me to create and you know draw very um geometric kind of kind of vehicles and stuff like that but getting away from art what inspired me more for writing or what gave me um like a a reaction and sort of drove me to write was um if, have you guys ever seen the uh, tv series the storyteller uh, it's a jim henson um created by the Jim Henson studio so what they had there was a um a multimedia tv series that uh, has uh, puppetry and like animation all sorts of stuff and so you've got this um narrator like narrating a story and then you have the story actually visualized you know it's it's like uh, there's puppets and all this kind of stuff and it's like showing the story um it's like visualizing the story with these these uh like actors and animatronics and all sorts of stuff and it was incredibly interesting so there's like you the the end result is like this amazing depiction of a fantasy story with actors doing it and the very first story that is done uh for the storyteller is um what you also see in the witcher in that you know the uh that porky pet porcupine man who like you know has the the lore of surprise that is actually based on an old german folk tale and the storyteller did this right back in the 80s so yeah not very original and uh like i don't know the makeup and all that was done a lot better in the storyteller in this 80s thing than it was in in the witcher which is quite surprising but you know <laughs> G the jim henson uh, studio were just you know they these people were masters anyway i'm i'm digressing um the this excellent series the storyteller illustrated these german folk tales in such a unique and creative and clever way that that's sort of uh called forth a reaction from me and i was inspired to create a um a picture book based on well not based on these stories but my own version of them so i did my own kind of uh like a folk tale that i created from my head but heavily based on these these german folk tales as you know i'd seen done in the storyteller so i did my own version and you know i i painted it all up you know um i uh i drew like this was a picture book so i drew it and i painted it and i wrote it out and it was you know the my teacher actually thought i should publish it so yeah it was it got well quite a good reaction so anyway yeah that was my thing um anyway you guys what what was your first thing that you were uh, something that inspired you or nah, it's, it's hard to think of my first thing like he's like the stuff i remember came later weirdly enough like i i mean i would say like combining 
characters with actual stories combined with music you know the Muppets and then I would say the band Kiss and then mm-hmm. Alice Cooper that was really those were huge for me like in terms of getting interested in music and like becoming a drummer and then playing piano and stuff mm-hmm. it was like it was that stuff it was like the Muppet band they were iconic to me still are <laughs> And it was it was kind of like the fact that they would have, they had personalities and stories plus they were playing music that really got me excited and I'm pretty sure that was probably a motivator to oh, get yeah. into the arts and stuff like that my first one yeah. that's interesting yeah. the Muppet Band yeah they're quite evocative yeah. because these characters are based on um. Uh, they're based on musician stereotypes from the 1970s. Yeah. So you have sort of Joe Cocker, uh, Stevie Nicks, um, you know, these, these Dr. kind of... John. Yeah. Yes, exactly. These very iconic kind of looks that suggest backstories, that suggest a reason why these people look this way and act this way animal on the drums you know that kind of thing it's why (laughs) why do they look this way why do they behave this way it's not just just a a character created from thin air they have reasons for being this way and it gave them such a unique look i had no clue about that as a kid or for many years after i had no clue where these Mm -hmm. character kind of archetypes came from no yeah that was like a, a super powerful early influence and ironically oh, just, another jim henson thing that's right yeah so <laughs> interesting <laughs> interesting Henson was uh, i remember yeah he he was a staple it came to creativity and creating his settings growing up i'm not sure but i think uh, the dark crystal also was his wasn't it was it was indeed um but brian froud uh, was the um the the guy who who's the look of those things were based on so brian froud jim Mm -hmm. henson which is yeah another that was brian froud that was something um if you remember um what was that movie the dark crystal so I think yeah, yeah. Jim Henson's done. Oh, oh, not the Dark Crystal. Um, shit. Why am I saying the Dark Crystals? Because you said the Dark Crystal. Um, <laughs> so Dark Crystal was with the Gelflings and all that kind of stuff. I'm thinking of yeah. the David Bowie film. Oh, the Labyrinth. The Labyrinth. There we are. So another thing. So we've got the Jim Henson and we've got Brian Froud creating the look of like the you know. Those, the, the creatures from that and that was that stuff was very inspiring to me because um yeah, yeah brian froud's amazing imagery and his uh his depictions of fairy creatures and goblins mm-hmm. which became very very inspiring to me um you know his he he created the modern idea of the fairy and the goblin was all created by Brian Froud. A lot of people don't realize that. That was all his, you know, you, every time you see these, these bloody fairies with their, um, dragonfly wings and stuff like that, these beautiful, like new little right. nymphs and stuff, he, or, you know, goblins and elves, like with big noses and stuff. That was all Froud's creation. That was, that was him, him, I, and perhaps his wife as well. They created this, all that imagery together mm-hmm. so yeah that was amazingly amazingly um uh inspiring and yeah those those people inspired me anyway um sorry guys i've just taken over um anyway tons and bains i i remember uh like we i did say i didn't mention in uh in the uh, patron uh, video the, about my initiation into writing stuff at all um, but I remember that the tone for my stories and the way that I approach writing stories was forged through like a, a whole bunch of things 
uh, that uh, when I actually started writing my stuff and not just trying to be uh, like any blight on or copy uh, like uh, episodes like MacGyver or, or something like that because I was trying to write something like that initially. So I remember uh, really being inspired to write something of my own and and uh, create something that was original, came from me completely, uh, when I saw Lady Hawk. <laughs> oh, um, and right. I think yeah, yeah. Around, around that time I had also seen um, either the Dark Crystal or something like dark fantasy, like a bit haunting, at least for kid measures. I don't remember what was the other thing. It will, it will come to me. But, um, um, and I remember that the biggest thing that struck me, and I really liked in, in the entire movie of uh, Lady Hawk, except the fact that Michelle Fiverr is gorgeous, that movie, <laughs> very young and very gorgeous. <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't remember the other guy's name now. Uh, Ratka Hewa. Uh, Rucker Hauer. Rucker Hauer, yeah. And Matthew yes. Broderick and Leo McKern. Yes. These are the principal uh, actors in this movie. <laughs> Remember? Yes, excellent. Uh, the one thing that I really liked was the idea of consequence and choice. And the fact that, you know, choosing to do something or not to do something has direct consequences that affect your life completely. Uh, I really like that. I, I remember. Oh, okay. The other one that I, I saw around that time and it inspired me was the the Princess Bride, which is a completely oh. different tone, but it also has a dark streak going, you know, just under the yeah. current yeah. in the story. And and I really liked these two were very big influences in the way that I write in general. I think. At least the way I'm, I'm thinking about it right now. So, oh, it's Princess Bride. Yeah. Did Did you yes. happen to see, like those two are very connected to me because like the cool people who I eventually met <laughs> were into <laughs> those movies. And another one, I'm curious if you know, uh, the Adventures of Baron Munchausen. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember being. I don't know when I saw that. I remember very vividly myself watching it, but I also remember, I cannot remember it for the life oh, okay. of me. Yeah. But I remember watching it, I remember the feel, I, the, the, the scenes from the movie, but I think either I was confused a little bit by it or something like mm -hmm. that. I, but I, I, it did make an impression enough that I have a Kodak moment memory in my okay. head of me watching. So yeah. <laughs> it's, it's worth the read. It's worth watching again because it's a it's it's a Terry Gilliam film, um, and mm -hmm. a lot of his films have a magical reality, and mm -hmm. they've got a magical reality, and sometimes they're um, very um, they're dysphemistic in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a magical reality, Definitely. but things are going sure. to shit in some ways. What was that, Vince? Yeah, I said I need my dictionary. Yeah, well, well, what I mean is, is that um, <laughs> by dismissive, it's it's like um, things are going to crap. Like there's a dark kind of evil under the surface, yeah. and that is very much in Baron Munchausen. Um, you know, all these amazing Gilliam films, um, Brazil, which is a, a great one, mm -hmm. and. Even the Fisher King definitely has that undercurrent of, of sadness. Yeah. Yes. Um, Time Bandits. Yes. Massively That's so. Big one. And these things were very inspiring to me too because that that dreamlike reality... Um, Don't touch it, it's evil. <laughs> <laughs> that that dreamlike... That was just a depressing ...version ending. of <laughs> reality that he depicts was just so inspiring to me because I love that that dream reality stuff that's magical reality and speaking of two more movies that again stayed with me and resonated for different reasons 
uh, the never ending story yes uh, especially that uh, scene with the horse uh, in the quicksand or in the tar oh, um, that, uh, actually dies was I remember being shocked by the fact that the movie went there that they actually allowed the horse to die and I remember thinking to myself wow that was very powerful I should use it I remember myself making this particular thought as I was watching it and then I remembered to also be sad <laughs> about it but um, the, the biggest thing was oh my god this is so powerful like I have to like this is the big guns I have to keep it in mind oh wow well, that's, that's interesting sort of it's also what's interesting to me is you've mentioned the, the princess bride and never ending mm-hmm. story and these are things with a um, it's a, a it's a meta narrative or it's yeah. it's at least yeah it's the narrative outside of the story itself which I, I think you call it a meta narrative mm-hmm. don't you so that that's quite interesting yeah yeah um, and the third and the other movie again that I was uh, riveted and I watched it I don't know two three four times uh, before you know the the VHS went back to the video club <laughs> um, it, it was uh, the Wizard of Oz Return to Oz number, the number two movie that had the woman with the many heads that she kept uh, in the cupboards. Yes. I loved that. Quite, quite <laughs> scarring to a lot that of young was actually people. Dark. I, I absolutely loved it as a young person. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't get scared by the things that other kids got scared for some reason. But that, it was hauntingly mesmerizing. And I remember really liking the stakes and and how dismal this very bright world was because you still have you know the very bright colors and the larger than life imagery in that but it has this pall of darkness surrounding everything. Yeah, uh, funny. I really like it. Funny you mentioned mm-hmm. there is a great song by Scissor's sister uh, called "Return to Oz" based on that uh, oh. you know, that that story, and so this is a song, but it's about I think the the metaphor they they're using it as a metaphor for um, you know people in the gay community who have you know in, enjoyed this amazing experiences and stuff and you know how AIDS and that kind of stuff has devastated. You know ah, what? What? Okay. And meth addiction and stuff like that has devastated this once bright and, and joyous community. You know, mm-hmm. return because Return to Oz is like, oh wow, I'm going back to this magical kingdom and you know, to finding that you know stuff is rusty and and awful and you know things are broken down and it's not such a, a joyous place mm-hmm. anymore. I'm seeing what's behind the what's behind the scenes now. This is this is terrible. So that's that's quite interesting. So yeah, that's a yeah. It's that I, I way. Just generally, I remember, and I remember thinking like, the the woman with the many heads stuck a lot, uh, but not because she was scary. But she struck me as the weakest character in the entire cast, uh, even as a villain, because she was so self conscious of her own uh, face and basically her looks and she struck me as such a sad character that would actually cut off her own head and and put on another just to look better (laughs) and I remember thinking about all these things anyway I I really appreciated that that particular movie for that Um, so there, there was that and again there is also Gulliver's Travels um, oh, Gulliver's Travels. Not yeah. as a movie. Right? The book. Yeah, in the universe. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Gulliver's Travels. Um, so, but not the movies that have, yeah. have come out of the book. The book itself. The book, I think, 
it was my first uh, sort of uh, like someone pushed me off the deep end <laughs> in in uh, allegories about society. So <laughs> when I was uh, reading it, and I remember that the third part that very few movies actually use which is uh, with the civilized horses and the, that use uh, humans as livestock <laughs> uh, uh, is very, very striking. Yes, people yes. tend not to... They, they tend to like just the uh, the tiny people and and the, the big people, exactly. the giants, yes. But yeah. the Ted Danson the, a miniseries... Um, mm-hmm. That has the horses and everything, so that would that's something to oh, check really? out if you haven't seen that. it. Yeah, it's not bad. That's that's a good rent. I think yeah, that's it wasn't noted. bad actually. Yeah. yeah, surprisingly, pretty good. I haven't seen the Jack Black mm-hmm. movie. It looked terrible. Yeah. I didn't even try. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not interested. Yeah, I think. I think uh, Galway Travels are one of the is one of those books that are given to kids where they are not actually intended for kids per se. They are maybe masquerading as kids' literature, but they are really for for adults uh, because they will get the the symbolism a lot more than any kid reading it. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. It's a lot of that kind of stuff, I think, that like kids get their hands on books that are intended for adults, and then later, you know, movies mm-hmm. that are intended for adults, like they get their hands on these like mm-hmm. horror movies and stuff, or these like creepy animated movies or whatever. And that's that's formative, I think, for a lot of uh, kids. A lot of us more kind of maybe unusual kind of people. <laughs> That kind of stuff. I mean that in a good way. But we are the norm. Inspires you to think. Well, one one of the big things for me was um, now that I'm remembering it, it take, takes a while for you to sort of think about this subject and get into it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and I think for a lot of people uh-huh. that was a very formative thing. So I first got into that through the radio play, which was the um, that was. That was how it was originally done as a radio play. And I just found this, oh my God, this is just amazingly addictive. This bizarre radio show, unlike anything else. This just incredible and this, this weird kind of philo- philosophical takes on the universe. And it's this just incredible kind of thing. And then I, you know, later on I got the books and read those and got further into it. And that was something that was really quite that got a reaction for me that was quite a formative thing because it it gave me a new way of looking at the universe and a new way of looking at things which you know that was life, universe yeah life the universe and everything exactly <laughs> and, and uh, oh, please go. Yeah. well further to that um uh doctor who which I mean, a lot of people know. Everybody knows Doctor Who now, but back in the day, it was like the original series of Doctor Who, and of course, the the two uh, kings of Doctor Who in back in the day were uh, Pertwee and uh, Baker, Tom Baker, and these people were like. <sighs> this gave me a new way of looking at protagonists. So, you know, you you grow up on the stuff that's intended for kids and you have, like, you know, like uh, teenage protagonists and all this kind of stuff. Now, Doctor Who presents you with a mature man as the protagonist. And it's not only a mature man as a protagonist, but it's a mature man who is solving things not with his fists, and he, mm. but with his brain and his wit and his humor and being in, just absolutely unconcerned with the uh, you know the the hubris and the violence and the viciousness of the people around him and he's just combating that with humor and wit and cleverness which was a very very unusual thing at the time because yeah all the stuff you'd you'd see was was all about yeah I'm stronger I'm faster I'm 
better fighter. Mm -hmm. But no, it wasn't at all. And he was totally unconnected with the situation. So it's like people going, oh, my God, this thing is so bad. You know, this this guy is so great. He's so, so amazing and we should worship him. And Doctor Who comes in going, woof. Yeah, he might think he's great, but, you know, I don't really give a stuff about him and, and what he thinks is, is amazing. You know, this is ridiculous. I'm a Time Lord. I live for, for thousands of years. I, you know, have been, I've seen the birth of the universe. I, your pretensions really aren't so great. You know, you're just funny to me. And that was um, mm-hmm. a really, really interesting thing as a, as a child to see that. Anyway, so, yeah. You guys, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> But um, the other thing I remember in that vein, in the vein of uh, being inspired and, and getting things that stayed with me, one is uh, traumatic, actually traumatic, and the other is just, uh, oh, okay, I will remember never to do that. Huh. <laughs> and um, the traumatic one was uh, Grave of the Fireflies that I watched for the first time when I was very or relatively young, like I remember I must have been late uh, elementary school somewhere out there and I remember sitting down to watch uh, you know, the cartoon and I was just, it was like uh, an onslaught of stab attacks at my soul Uh, (laughs) (laughs) that was never uh, alleviated and there was no catharsis whatsoever. And I remember the particular scene with the watermelon at the end. If you know, I don't want to spoil it if people haven't seen it, but the particular scene with uh, the boy giving uh, watermelon to his sister towards the end, that destroyed me, absolutely destroyed me. And it stayed with me just the, the sheer, um, the sheer actual tragedy of the entire thing. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't the think. Name I... of the movie? What was it? The Grave of the Fireflies. Grave of the Fire... Oh, okay. Yeah, it's very, very <laughs> sad. It's a Miyazaki film that mm-hmm. is not like the typical Miyazaki films. It's very, no. very sad. It's a trap. <laughs> It, it's a trap well <laughs> the, it's interestingly thematically it it plays exactly into the japanese uh philosophy and psyche of saying okay and this is an asian thing as well uh not not to be racial this is just a culturally asian thing in that we are stronger as a community we are stronger when we rely on and help each other and that's the message the message of the film is that the boy was issuing the help of relatives and friends and community and he thought he could he could get on by going it alone and the film is is like showing like no this is what happens when you go it alone you fail if only he yeah. had he had gotten help from the people around him and and he had helped them if only he had done that instead of being pride prideful and mm-hmm. pride is and you know going alone is punished so yeah that that is a uh, a culturally asian thing that is definitely an, a, a way of interpreting but I, the way it struck me back then and i actually still maintain that interpretation about why he he does all that is that he actually has PTSD and he doesn't want anyone to help him because it's a defense mechanism and he tries to be safe for himself and his sister. Of course, in every in all their own ways, and nobody can actually approach him properly and stuff like that. But I do think that it is a fallout of war that causes a big part of his of his uh, self-isolation, let's say, than anything else. Uh, but yeah, definitely, the, the, that particular interpretation that you said is the well, norm, how people, the theme of the movie. Yeah, well, that's, um, that's the Miyazaki yeah, kind of, that's the what theme, he said anyway. Yeah, 
uh, but the thing is how it sucked you in you couldn't turn your eyes away although it was punch after punch after punch in the gut uh, until the very end of the movie and and that I I was completely impressed by it and I uh, bowled over in a sense on the one hand and on the other hand I said like I will never watch that movie again mm -hmm. ever <laughs> um, so that was one and, and the other one was originally a radio play that I never actually listened to on the radio because it was uh, broadcast somewhere in the late 50s early 60s somewhere there I don't remember um, but I do have the whole transcript as a, as a book and, and it was a ghost story, excellent ghost story. It's about this girl that is, uh, we, we, and, and that's actually the one book that uh, determined a, a very big part of my writing style, I think, because I really like the way that uh, you are eased into the story. And you start with the female uh, protagonist, uh, she's uh, 18 years old, and she wants to die. That's the first line. Mm. She goes this uh, weird castle that is overlooking you know your classic uh, weird uh, haunted castle uh, overlooking a crag uh, with a uh, uh, wild sea at the bottom crashing against you know the, the whole shebang it's gothic anyway, yeah that's she, a standard gothic true so she she goes there and she is afraid of nothing because she is very suicidal and she she actually wants <laughs> to die um, you know, after uh, uh, being dumped at the altar or something like that, anyway, she and uh, being very shamed from her community, so she goes to that particular castle, uh, supposedly as a secretary to help with uh, um, uh, housekeeping affairs and stuff, but really just to have a, uh, an excellent cliff to throw herself <laughs> from. Um, but she gets uh, sucked into this weird mystery that intrigues her because she's very intelligent. And then um, things happen that are very mysteriously odd and off and creepy and dangerous in this particular castle that is supposedly haunted. Uh, she doesn't believe in ghosts, but then a lot of things uh, that are extremely scary without being jump scares and stuff because how do you do a jump scare uh, on the radio <laughs> yeah. um, without you know, uh, hurting eardrums or something. Um, so she, she, uh, the, you get uh, genuinely scared okay. as you with her in this castle. And every single character in that particular castle looks like a killer yeah. of some sort or a murderer of some sort in different versions and so there is a murder that happens or a couple of murders actually uh, that have happened and one that happens during the story and she has to understand who is the killer and who is not who is the ally and who isn't and whether there is an actual freaking ghost because they are saying that the ghost is the one that murders everyone mm. uh, so and everyone actually buys into that, which drives her up the wall. Like uh, the com the constable says, "Yes, yes, it's the ghost uh, that uh, does that." And she says, "Like, how could you do that? How could are you writing on your report that uh, you know culprit ghost? They're like, how do how does that work? <laughs> uh, because uh, it's supposed to be a, a super old uh, era. Uh, you, we don't really know what era it is. It is never said, but it can't be." earlier than, say, 1890s or 1910s, around there, that should be the earlier, the earliest uh, of the settings right. uh, that it could be missing from uh, the sphere technology that, that exists there. So, uh, the story unfolds uh, and everything, and in the end, there is a cop-out. Like, they, they, the, the mystery is solved in a very nice way, but the culprit of course, there is no ghost. Spoiler, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you have a <laughs> story, you don't know the title. <laughs> um, so the, there is no ghost, but um, 
the, the entire castle has this secret tunnel system where there is this character that we never see in the entire book that is using it and he's the one performing the committing the murders like a and, phantom of the opera kind of thing yes very much so but in the phantom of the opera you know that you know you have eric there and mm. he is the one that is doing it in this particular one you don't ever see him until the very end where he gets caught oh. and i hated that that was the one thing i really like the book i still read it at the at times but what I absolutely hated was that nobody was uh, nobody was uh, the culprit. Everybody was innocent. Mm. It was this other guy that we have never met and have no investment in. That is the bad guy. Yeah. So, and I remember uh, that I actually actually I rewrote that legitimately <laughs> for one of my classes. Uh, of my English learning classes and I gave it the proper ending that it deserved considering the narrative and I'm not saying that in a conceited way because if you were to sit down and see how the story was laid out it there was no other way to have murders being committed except by a very specific character that you were expecting would be unveiled and yeah. uh, so I wrote it to be like this and it worked a lot better uh, and uh, the that's kids were they hide and, and so so on and so forth. And I remember even back then when I read it and I said, you know, never do that. Always have the guts to just uh, point the finger at uh, the person that is most likely to do such and such things, in a sense. Yeah, don't if, put if a, you know what I mean. Don't put a twist in just for the sake of a twist. Especially yes, a twist that you can't actually tell that yeah. is coming at all. It's yeah. one of those subversions that uh, just appear out of nowhere, and that's the bad yeah, the cheat. About it. Yeah, it's bad. Right? Yeah, it yeah. should be something that has a connection to the story you just read, so it rewards you. Exactly. What? Yeah, rather than just sticking a ringer in. Oh, was mm -hmm. you could never guess this. Well, I'm so clever. No, it's not because you're clever as a writer. Yeah, it's because yeah. you're stupid as a writer. Exactly. And he, he, the writer that wrote the particular radio play, is uh, was he's dead. Uh, very, very good. Uh, the play was called the Leonora, or Eleanor. In, uh, that would be the name. That's the name of the girl because we see and learn everything through her. It's a first person limited. The story is, uh, goes through the entire story like this, with this point of view. Mm. So, yeah. And I, I told myself, like, how could you do that? Like, you, you are a first class writer and author. Why would you do that? <laughs> But uh, yeah, other than that, it's a, it's an amazing story, and I really wish they made it into a movie. It would be very atmospheric, very very frightening, because you do get scared reading it. Um, and I I expect that uh, listening to it uh, the radio, you know, with the lights off and stuff, it would be very scary as well. I think it would make an excellent horror story. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. thriller because it's a mystery. Especially the gothic setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the castle itself is like a character, and you are afraid of the of the frigging castle. <laughs> like you are afraid of it's like you know. Can we just you know move into the city that is very near the castle? Must we stay here? <laughs> that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. That's that's a, a thing that the genre is known for. The, the Gorman Gast mm -hmm. is another gothic, gothic story where the mm -hmm. castle is a character. Um, castle of Otranto was the first gothic story, but I think I think things are unexplained in that one. I cannot tell you too much about Castle of Otranto because I have not read it. Apparently, it's not meant to be a very oh. good story. <laughs> oh, okay. 
So, yeah. But yeah, I remember, I even remember the lay, and that's another thing, it was such a masterful writing that you actually know the layout of the entire castle just through the story. They never actually tell you, oh, here is this and there is that, and but you know how the castle is, is arranged mm. and, and where the danger zone are. And, uh, uh, you know, where the, the creepy stuff happens. And stuff. So it's, now I'm going to go read it again, I think. <laughs> oh, definitely, <laughs> yeah. The... Um, Goldman Gast did the same sort of thing. You know exactly where everything is and what it looks like, and the castle is more of a character than the characters. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's, that is a. a very much a genre trope of the gothic horror. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to stop after this, but I have to gush a little bit more about it now that I remember it, <laughs> uh, talking about this. Um, there is this scene. The, the castle mistress is one of the prime sus suspects. Uh, she, she is she has a, she's probably like a bipolar or something like that because she has this uh, very good side to her and extremely evil and sadistic mm -hmm. side to her as well. So uh, she's an excellent pl piano player and we hear her playing uh, Moonlight Sonata because it's one of her favorites. Uh, and then supposedly she dies and we keep hearing the particular piece mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, it's it's very very haunting because she's also extremely beautiful and she sits in the moonlight uh, at this big piano and she plays on her own and it's like everything is completely frozen mm -hmm. around her for some reason. Um, yeah. Evocative and really creepy. Wow. Yeah, that's creepy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and then you hear the particular sound again, and you start believing that within this story, ghosts do exist. But in the end, it's that the crypt uh, that was uh, in the system, in the underground system of the castle, also had the piano, and she was alive because she had faked her death. And she was just playing the song because she really liked it, and everyone was listening to it, thinking that it was her haunting the the castle so I think that was a master stroke mm -hmm. among other things so, yeah <laughs> what about you by <laughs> because, oh go on yeah sorry no 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 no, no I'm, I'm gonna stop I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot to say definitely like Tan's bringing up that idea of the uh, the melancholy and the darkness mm -hmm. that streak underlying everything I I don't know if I would have identified that myself earlier, but I, I definitely have always loved that stuff. I've always felt like a sort of semi-melancholy middle-aged man, even when I was a kid. <laughs> I've always been that way. And this that's a thread in everything I write, including, I mean, my comic is like comedy, and a lot of times it's silly comedy, but there's a melancholy underneath it, as is it's there in everything I write and even you know like going back to the Muppets and other stuff like there's that there's an edge to it and there's sort mm -hmm. of a dark darkness might be a strong word but there's definitely an edge to mm. like all that stuff like underlying I like that kind of stuff um, horror was huge for me the horror movies I saw on TV as a kid uh, When a Stranger Calls Halloween Friday the 13th definitely that idea of like the creepy noise outside or being home alone and getting calls that is all all went into a story so <laughs> later um, babysitters so huge yeah babysitters exactly <laughs> the calls uh, the coming from inside I made up from inside the house yeah, exactly. uh, characters I made up were superheroes at first like the first time I made up original characters it would have been there and it's all related to what they looked like, what their powers were. Um, before I ever thought about writing complete stories, it was that kind of stuff. Interesting. Um, completed things came later. I would say I was influenced a lot by uh, by friends. Like I, I often didn't have that vision myself that I could write stuff and 
I could make stuff and show people until uh, a lot later in school and my friends would make little movies and tell little sort of comedic maybe sort of Monty Python-esque maybe sort of uh, David Letterman-esque mm -hmm. at the time like little uh, homemade low-budget things that they would make that was a huge inspiration for me to realize like, oh, wow wow I could do that like I could do that I could make up stuff myself <laughs> I was like I'd never really thought that way other than just, like I said, making up characters, and drawing partial stories, writing partial stories. So, uh, oh, yeah. And then okay. comics, you know, X-Men was a massive influence. The X-Men comics. Mm -hmm. X-Men, really? Cause that got... one in particular, I would say, is a lasting, yeah, the Chris Claremont, with many years of him and different artists. So. Any particular characters or storylines or the fact that they had a massive roster of... Um... Of characters. It influenced me in general with the team idea and even deeper with the sort of idea of the outcast slash hero mm. idea, oh. the outsiders who were heroes. Yeah, well, yeah. Even yeah. my short stories, I would end up turning into team books before I really knew how to do it, and they would all fall apart. <laughs> they bring in all these characters. <laughs> it's like it started off good, but now it's too much. You know, like it goes off the rails, and that then it would just peter out. Yeah, so, you yeah. Know, then my, my comic is a team, you know, Typical Strange is a team book. I like ca a cast of characters together. That's kind of... Oh, that's um, interesting, yeah. Cause, uh, but a lot of their endings, like, are very much altered versions of, like, in the big moments, some of them anyway, are altered versions of some X-Men comic books. <laughs> I never would get that. No, I hopefully I altered them enough <laughs> that nobody would really know. Uh, yeah, and then even later it would be you know like Kevin Smith movies, and then even later than that Edgar Wright and his like sort of normie or, or sort of like slacker mm. heroes put into genre stories like that's amazing to me. You know? mm -hmm. Oh yeah, kind of what I try to do. You know? Hot Fuzz and um, Shaun of the Dead, yeah, spiced. Yeah. 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 I think that was uh, uh, around the time where the anti-hero started being a thing, like uh, very much it started becoming uh, mainstream more than the straight-laced uh, Captain America-style hero as much. So, yeah, because the 70s mm -hmm. anti-heroes were more, those were definitely more mature audience films, I, mm -hmm. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. like, you know, your anti-heroes at that time, that was a different... They were yes, yeah, very dark yeah. and heroes. Yeah. Kids aren't going to see those movies usually. I don't think. Very different from the uh, the nineties and the two thousands anti heroes, who were a lot more um, safer <laughs> for general consumption. Yeah, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're not all good. Yeah. Oh my God. But... Most the anti hero. <laughs> Hey. Yeah. What was that, Tons? No, I said the like uh, the anti-hero uh, trademark would be like a uh, like a regular hero, but he smokes. Yes. Right. That's uh... a. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the what a shocker! <laughs> exactly. Whereas in the nineteen seventies, your anti-heroes were going out and. Murdering people, the mm -hmm. you, like yeah, your Clint Eastwood, uh, Dirty Harry kind of thing. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. very much a different. I would uh, John Wick be described as a as a modern version of that? Um, yeah, definitely, I would say. But he is. He... Although I go on, mm -hmm. as... he could also be a a villain. That is just like an anti-villain, I would say, because he really, he doesn't really have redeeming qualities. He's just oh, he does. Uh, very. He likes his wife and he likes dogs, and there's a massive, <laughs> massive like anchors pointing that's why to the he's good side. Hey. Yeah, that's why he's appealing, but he still is like a hitman, and uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, definitely John Wick would be an anti-hero for sure. I would yeah. say. Um, 
And in the 70s, I think, wasn't it in the 70s that Rambo was made? Or was it the early, early 80s? Early 80s. Probably 80s. Yeah. Early 80s, okay. Because uh, that would be an, an anti-hero to that, for sure. Oh, yeah. The, the original Rambo, very much so. Uh, Rambo 2 First Blood, more a hero. I haven't seen that, so... <laughs> Well, yeah, so the original Rambo First Blood was actually a, a, sort of a clever kind of take on that. It's it's not what people expect because you see Rambo, a lot of people would more would see, I think, Rambo 2 and expect different things. And that's your first, uh, like, uh, or Rambo 3. That's people's first kind of um, introduction to the story, whereas Rambo 1 is... First Blood, Rambo First Blood is, yeah, very much an anti-hero story about a, a veteran mm -hmm. coming back from the war and being mistreated by the police and going and having a breakdown and mm -hmm. then becoming the weapon he was trained to be and just letting loose on the world and the world sort of, um, uh, you know, America paying for what it has created because they it didn't mm -hmm. care for him, and now it is the target of his wrath rather than the enemy that he was trained to fight. Mm -hmm. and that's it was quite a um. It was what am I trying to say? It was it was a good sort of comment. It was a film that had a bit of a commentary on how mm -hmm. veterans were treated and like the end of the the Vietnam War, whereas yeah. Well, yeah. I remember that it was mentioned in, in some of the courses I I had at times uh, where we talked about depicting uh, uh, psychological disorders and how they were depicted in, in uh, mainstream movies and stuff. And Rambo's breakdown and the entire presentation of it was... Um, has always been uh, considered one of the best depictions of PTSD at the at the particular era, uh, because he they make they take a, a lot of time in the scene with the uh, douchebag cops to show how he gets the the flashbacks and where the associations are and why he is uh, unresponsive before he lashes out and then he just stays stuck in that particular Vietnam mode, let's say. Mm. So there's also that. Uh, it's, it's interesting. That is, uh, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is that is very much the thing, yeah, depicting the, the, the mental breakdown that happens to those uh, Vietnam vets and what we had not seen with the uh the second world war and first world war people but obviously that that had been experienced but had not been illustrated or brought to public attention um as a character goes rambo one rambo first blood really doesn't have a sequel in that that character could not could not appear in another story it just doesn't make sense for that character to appear in another story so what you get with rambo uh, like 2 and Rambo 3 and Rambo 4 or however many other things is a totally different character that is not the mm -hmm. what you saw in the first movie that is something completely mm -hmm. different because you just can't carry on from where you left off in Rambo uh, First Blood sorry for the aggressing but it's interesting to talk about this stuff yeah it's, it's fascinating actually yeah, especially to That's give all... An influence. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. It kind of mixes together. Mm -hmm. If you see that stuff, especially if you see it when you're younger. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I didn't see Rambo when I was younger, the first Blood one, but I did see Rambo 2 and 3, which is a very different character, and that is quite influential in that it, it is solidly the 1980s muscle man action hero. And that is, that inspired, you know, um, a way of thinking because that is, okay, might makes right. Uh, being physically muscular 
and fit means you are also morally superior and you know you can fight better than everyone else you know that because you are so fit because you are like are able to withstand withstand wounds and stuff like that means you are like you you can trump anything you can conquer anything just because just by pure physicality alone and that that was the message that those films really taught you and there's like all those 1980s things with all these uh people like um kurt russell and arnold schwarzenegger um oh i remember now another movie and that i will not talk again because i i hog the time when i do that um (laughs) is uh, that movie with uh, Rutger Hauer, I think, called Blind Fury, which is about this American guy that gets blinded. I think it was in uh, Vietnam that he gets blinded. Uh, but uh, the Viet Cong actually take him in and, and help nurse him back to health. He remains blind, but they teach him to actually be a blind swordsman. Uh, All right. He was, uh, like, uh, I think it's a katana. I'm not sure. Um, so he has, and in the movie, this this we watch this entire sequence of him being over the years uh, taught, nursed back to health, and taught how to to basically use all his other senses to be completely independent and uh, be able to fight with a sword and everything. And then the during the uh, beginning titles, and then the movie starts with him returning to America. Uh, and I really liked it. I, it was amazing that they depicted a, a character who was disabled and didn't have a superpower in order to, like a daredevil or something, in order to go around it. He had put in hard work over years in order to become a particular, you know, force that he was. And um, I, that fascinated me. And still fascinates me. So there, there you oh, go. <laughs> yeah. There we are. A, a vote of confidence for a 1980s action film. I haven't seen that one. Mm-hmm. It did not uh, it existed. I don't remember much about it, but I remember loving the idea. And because we all, me and my friends, loved uh, Rutger Hauer, of course, at the time, mm-hmm. and uh, and for always. <laughs> And also, it was like that. Is that? It's like Daredevil, man. It's like basically like mm-hmm. doing a Daredevil movie when superhero movies didn't exist. Oh, right, yeah. So mm-hmm. we're all like, he's so much like Daredevil. <laughs> <laughs> he was very much like Zat- Zatoichi, or how it's pronounced. Uh, but with the American, yeah. the blind, uh, the blind swordsman that is also Japanese, I think. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, they've got a fam- a, Japanese have a big register of famous swords, like you, um, Jimbo, whatever. The guy with the gigantic sword, and then you've got uh, mm-hmm. Masamuni, um, all these kind of famous characters. Um, for me, one of the things that was massively, massively, you know, struck a chord in me was the the Lord of the Rings, and this is the same with a lot of people, I imagine. Well, it was not just imagine; it literally was the same with like millions and millions of people. But when I was young, I read the the books because the, the movies did not exist, and yeah massively massively influential to me you know um i created a lot of art based on this these fantasy depictions mm-hmm. well i i created yeah. fantasy depictions based on the the lord of the rings world which i found amazingly interesting you know when when i was younger we there were art books for um dungeons and dragons that i'd see in the library and i think oh god this is it was interesting the way they've created these characters, but I never really knew much about those games. And but reading Lord of the Rings, you actually get to the root of what this all this stuff is based on. All this mythology, modern mythology about elves and dwarves and all this kind of stuff, all comes straight or all came from Lord of the Rings, and everybody else did their version of that afterwards. You know, it didn't come from. Um, 
like elves and dwarves come from Teutonic mythology, you know, uh, Norse mythology originally. Mm -hmm. But, and that's where Tolkien got his from. But that's not where the modern version came from. The modern version is like a bastardized version of uh, of, uh, Tolkien. You know, orcs don't exist in mythology anywhere. That is, Tolkien invented those. A lot of people don't realize that orcs are actually a um, a bigger version of goblins, which do exist in mythology. Mm-hmm. But Tolkien created his own own characters, which were orcs, which were like yeah. super goblins. And yeah, anyway, so I found that enormously influential, and I really, really just loved fantasy. And wanted to become a fantasy artist when I was a certain age and would draw horses with armor and knights with armor and, you know, banners and smoky scenes and mm-hmm. mountains and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, I found it amazingly, amazingly evocative and yeah. influential to me. Yeah, so that was a big thing for me. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember actually that we, we did have at the time. Uh, the Lord of the Rings uh, anima- animated movie that uh, comes oh, yeah. up to Ralph um, Bakshi did his version of um... yes yes uh, and just that not the other thing that happened later in animated uh, like the the Ten of the King is terrible but the Lord of the Rings uh, by Bakshi although the depiction of the hobbits yeah okay leaves a lot to be desired the way that uh, he depicted the ring wraiths and the plane of existence of the ring wraiths uh, uh, also is amazing in how haunting he made them look mm. you know with uh, uh, I, I forget the method in which uh, like they they film the actors and then they draw over them. Oh, something. rotoscoping! I don't it's called rotoscoping. Yes, thank you. Yeah, but it worked really well for these particular sequences where the ring rays were basically after Frodo and Frodo was seeing them in their own plane of existence. Mm. And uh, I remember that uh, this stuck with me so much that when I wrote my my own trilogy of uh, high fantasy. I, I had parallel planes of existence for my seer character, basically. Oh, okay. So, yeah, that's where it came from. Well, <laughs> Not the Lord of the Rings, just Bax's Yeah, Lord of Bax's the Rings. interpretation. <laughs> well, speaking of that, um, when I first like got into Led Zeppelin, it wasn't just it wasn't because of Led Zeppelin were you know a cool rock band mm-hmm. it was because they had uh this folk music um in in mm-hmm. a lot of the early Led Zeppelin lot of the, and it was because at the time of you know the early days of Led Zeppelin uh Robert Plant the lead singer and also the um the writer of a lot of the songs he was reading Lord of the Rings and learning about mythology in uh, Wales and stuff like that, where he was writing a lot of his, um, a lot of the songs. And he was inspired by that and included stuff in his books, like, I mean, stuff in his songs, like um, uh, <sighs> Battle Forevermore. You know, that specifically mentions stuff straight from uh, Lord of the Rings in that, you know, the ring rays arrive in black. You know, he has that as as the oh. lyrics, yeah. And a lot of the songs are based on this kind of stuff. You know, you have um, talking about uh, uh, knights trudging through the snow in their bright armor and stuff. So I found that very, very um, uh, evocative to me and influential, and that gave another dimension to this whole. Lord of the Rings stuff. That's why I was quite disappointed when the the when Peter Jackson finally produced his film because it was uh-huh. um, years and years in the making because people weren't you know they really wanted to someone to have the right kind of vision to produce these and and turn these into a cinematic version. 
and I'd grown up with, you know, I'd, I'd read The Lord of the Rings and grown up with, like, many, many different depictions of it, you know, Bakshi, um, many, many different fantasy yeah. artists, many singers inspired by it creating music, and Peter Jackson's version just basically has... Um, okay, so it's his vision on, on the screen and also one other fantasy artist that was quite popular at a time. Um, uh, there was a particular fantasy artist in the, the, the 90s, I think, and maybe the, the late 80s, I think, basically in the 90s, who was famous for doing like um, illustrations of Lord of the Rings for calendars and stuff like that. And he was the guy who Peter Jackson picked to, you know, to create like the visual yeah. look and feel of it. Whereas, and that disappointed me as an adult watching this because I'd been, you know, grown up with so many different art, artistic visions of this world and he's only got that particular one. It would have been interesting to see to, for him to incorporate all these, these things because the Lord of the Rings was amazingly influential to a lot of um, creators through the 1970s you know from the 1960s mainly into the 1970s and of course pretty much 90 percent of all fantasy art all fantasy writing was based on lord of the rings in the the 70s and the 80s you couldn't throw a stone without hitting yeah. 15 um uh, fantasy stories <laughs> directly inspired by lord of the rings <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember really uh, not that to mention it uh, when seeing the movies, the Lord of the Rings movies. The first one I think is the best of the three. Yes, uh, definitely. In terms of being faithful to the source material and everything. But I remember I was slightly disappointed when I saw the elves because the way I depicted them in my mind was almost like a, almost alien in in form and very resplendent and pale and stuff um, like uh, El Greco forms mm. if, uh, if you know what I mean like yeah, very tall, elongated, elongated. Very, yes elegant ethereal almost mm. and very much otherworldly signifying that they are basically not of this world anymore and um, yeah, we got uh, you know Pantene Legolas and uh, oh. Legolas. Yeah. I he's people's fa <laughs> a lot of people's favorite character because he's um, I don't know like a superhero who can do anything. He's yeah. basically superhero. Yeah. Yeah, shoots amazingly with these arrows. Whereas okay, Legolas first comes. I think doesn't he come in the Hobbit? I'm not sure. Legolas. I never him in the whole. Legolas is like a forest elf. So there's the different kinds of elves. Mm -hmm. He's he's a forest elf. So he's meant to be. He's a elf. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's he's meant to be a bit a bit more wily and a bit more um, you know, mm -hmm. like he he has forest craft all this kind of stuff. He's not a manicured bloody like he in the film he's this manicured kind of perfect guy with this straight blonde hair beautifully you know tied up in a certain way and, and you know hanging down yeah. over his clothes and he's not meant to be that kind of character he is this person who lives in the forest and he hunts for his food and you know he is mm -hmm. someone who is very able and he's, he's still an elf. He's still, you know, got a bit of hoity toityness about him, but not. Yeah, and he has the great of the elves and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. But he's, he's but more. But he's of... looked down upon by the yes. up down elves. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah, he's looked down upon because, I mean, in, in later, um, later fantasy stuff that's inspired by Lord of the Rings, of course, we have stuff like. Uh, forest elves and we have high elves and stuff like that and that's why those yeah that that's why you have those differentiations because 
this comes from Lord of the Rings. You have high elves, you have dark elves, and dark elves are actually mm-hmm. based on a um, just one particular elf from the Silmarillion. Anyway, I'm I'm digressing here, but yeah, that's uh, it's, it's interesting to talk about. We could have a whole uh, quack, quack cast just based on Lord of the Rings and how influential how influential it was oh let's do that yes. <laughs> let's do that for next podcast right. we will all be bored out of our minds with uh, quarantines all over the world let's talk Lord of the Rings and fantasy stuff yes next, uh, fantasy I love I love it yeah. fantasy the different aspects of fantasy and how it's changed yes. as well um, like later stuff that was uh either inspired by it or inspired to do something different like say um game of thrones is like mm-hmm. people might say oh that's nothing like Lord of the Rings. that's that's like a completely different kind of fantasy but in reality george r. r martin was deliberately trying not to do lord of the rings and doing things mm-hmm. different so lord of the rings has an not influence even there yeah, not really that differently. Just the instead of orcs, you have uh, white uh, walkers and uh, oh, no, the white walkers would be like the Urukai and and uh, their whites, right? However, they were white, pronounced. Yeah. I always, yes, well, well, the, they would be the orcs. the difference is in Lord of the Rings that is an honorable world. People do not mm. behave brutally and nastily, whereas in Game of Thrones, it's like it's this. Pre- yeah, it's, I people's idea that let's reality save, is really. What's that? Let's save it for the fun. Let's save all this for the fantasy cast. Like this is a small preview. You guys now tune in time for the fantasy cast. <laughs> the fantasy cast. All right. Well, that's that's yes. this cast ended. Thank you very much for um yes. for being here. Baines has uh, popped out. And yes. All right. Let's say goodbye. Talk to you next week, guys. All right. Goodbye, guys. Bye bye.